All right, welcome to pharmacology lecture number two. In this lecture, we're going to discuss autonomic pharmacology. So let's dive into our very first question, multiple choice. As always, go ahead and pause the video. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, cranial nerve three. Now let's, let's go to the next slide here. And we'll use this just to uh, sort of explain this concept. So you can't forget this image. You probably have seen this a million times by now. Um, so you know you have it here. Is if you want to if you want to refer to this one, it's a little simpler than the other ones. Uh, kind of cut out all of the um, noise and tried to just keep it very basic. But remember a few simple things from this slide. So remember that the pelvic splanchnic nerves and the cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and ten are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember that the parath the parasympathetic system has long presynaptic and short postsynaptic fibers. But on the other hand, the sympathetic system has the short presynaptic and long postsynaptic fibers. Remember that the adrenal medulla is innervated by preganglionic sympathetic fibers. And remember that the sweat glands, while part of the sympathetic system, are innervated by cholinergic fibers. When looking at our acetylcholine receptors, remember that the nicotinic receptors, characterized by NN, are ligand-gated sodium potassium channels. The NN receptors are found in autonomic ganglia and in the adrenal medulla, while the NM, the muscarinic receptors, are found at the neuromuscular junction of the skeletal muscle. Now, there's always a question on exam day about the effects of muscarinic stimulation, usually as a result of anticholinesterase poisoning. So, the effects of excessive muscarinic stimulation can of course be remembered with our handy mnemonic dumbbells, right? Let's just go through that real quick. D-U-M-B-B-E-L-L-S-S, -S, dumbbells, stands for diarrhea urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, amesis, lacrimation, sweating, and salivation. Remember that this can be reversed with what drug? Atropine, and that's effective against the muscarinic effects, but not the nicotinic effects. The effects of unregulated nicotinic stimulation is neuromuscular blockade. And we can reverse this with what drug? Pralidoxine. Good job if that's what you said. Just as a quick side note, remember that atropine is a muscarinic antagonist and it can be used to treat bradycardia as well as it has ophthalmic applications. And the side effects, which are usually high yield, include things like increased body temperature, increased heart rate, dry mouth, uh, dry and flushed skin, cycloplegia, constipation, as well as disorientation. All right, don't forget this slide, super high yield. All right, let's dive into our next question. As always, go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B, alpha two. So the micturition center is where? It's located in the pons and it regulates involuntary bladder function by coordinating the activities of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Remember, urination is parasympathetic. So if we wanna increase the activity of the parasympathetic nervous system, urination will occur. Same thing for sympathetic. If we wanna stimulate the sympathetic system, urinary retention will occur. Now, we can use medications to stimulate the receptors found in the bladder to alter the functions depending on what we want to achieve. So, for example, if we use a sympathomimetic drug to activate the beta-3 receptor, uh, that communicates with the hypogastric nerve, and that can cause relaxation of the detrusor muscle, thus increasing the bladder's capacity. So, sympathetic stimulation means we're going to have increased urinary retention. Now, on the other hand, if we want to use a muscarinic agonist like bethanicol, we could stimulate the M3 receptor. That is found at the pelvic nerve terminal. That will, of course, stimulate the detrusor to contract. That would increase bladder emptying. So stimulate sympathetic, bladder retention, stimulate parasympathetic, bladder um, emptying. Now, if we want to decrease the activity of the detrusor muscle, um, which could be overactive in cases of, let's say, urinary incontinence, we can either stimulate the sympathetic system with a drug like uh, Mirabegron, which is a B3 receptor agonist, or we can inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system with an M3 blocker like oxybutynin. Now, urinary retention requires that we know how to contract the detrusor muscle, which of course is controlled by which system? Parasympathetic system. This means by using a drug like Bethanicol, which is an M3 receptor agonist, we can stimulate detrusor muscle activity. This increases the rate of bladder emptying. In cases of BPH, where we've essentially got an obstruction due to an enlarged prostate, a drug like Tamsulosin, which is an alpha-1 blocker, which remember, the alpha-1 receptor contracts smooth muscle. If we use an alpha-1 blocker, we can relax that smooth muscle around the bladder neck and the prostate. That will lead to a decrease in urinary obstruction. 
Okay, so make sure you keep that in mind. Uh, urinary obstruction, um, urinary incontinence, these are really highly tested topics, so you wanna make sure you know the pharmacology around that. All right, let's move on to our next question. As always, hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, beta-1. Now, before we talk about the different receptors and how they work, let's do a quick review of GQ, GI, and GSG proteins. So GQ stimulates phospholipase C, which then hydrolyzes PIP2 into diacylglycerol and IP3. IP3 will act as that second messenger to release stored calcium into the cytoplasm, while DAG, diacylglycerol, acts as a second messenger that activates protein kinase C. The GS subunit binds adenylocyclase to produce cyclic AMP, which is the second messenger. Cyclic AMP then activates cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase A, PKA. That goes on to have a variety of functions through phosphorylation of certain proteins. And then we have the GI. I think inhibitory. The GI protein inhibits the cyclic AMP-dependent pathway by inhibiting adenylocyclase activity. This, of course, is going to result in the opposite effect of that GS subunit. So now that you've got that out of the way, now that we know what those three uh, proteins do, Let's take a look at the receptors that we need to know, which are the adrenergic receptors, the cholinergics, the dopamine, histamine, and vasopressin receptors. Let's start with the adrenergic receptors, which are alpha 1, 2, and then beta 1, 2, 3. So from alpha 1 through beta 3, we can remember which G proteins are used by the QISSS. Okay, alpha 1 uses GQ, alpha 2 uses GI, and then the uh, all three beta receptors, beta 1, 2, and 3, all use the GS subunit. So let's take a look at what happens when we stimulate all of these adrenergic receptors, starting with alpha-1. So what is this mediated by? GQ, okay? So alpha-1 is mediated by GQ, and this results in vascular smooth muscle contraction, medriasis via increased pupillary dilator muscle contraction, as well as increased intestinal and bladder sphincter muscle contraction. Alpha-2 is mediated by what G protein? GI. This results in the following in decreased sympathetic outflow, in decreased insulin release, in decreased lipolysis, in increased platelet aggregation, and decreased aqueous humor production. Okay, beta-1 is mediated by what G protein? They're all three, beta-1, 2, and 3 is GS, don't forget that. So stimulating the beta-1 is going to in, uh, result in increased heart rate, increased cardiac contractility, increased renin release, and increased lipolysis. Stimulation of the beta-2, which is of course mediated by the GS protein as well, will cause vasodilation, bronchodilation, increased lipolysis, increased insulin release, increased glycogenolysis, decreased uterine tone, increased cellular potassium uptake, and increased aqueous humor production. And then we have beta-3. This is also of course mediated by the GS protein, and this causes increased lipolysis, bladder relaxation, which we've touched on a few times already, and increased thermogenesis in skeletal muscle. All right, hopefully you guys got all that. Let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and pause and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, M3. So let's take a look at our cholinergic receptors, which are M1, M2, M3, and our dopamine receptors, which are D1 and D2. So the M1 receptor works through the GQ protein, and it works to both mediate higher cognitive functions and stimulate the enteric nervous system. The M2 receptor works through the GI protein, and when stimulated, will decrease heart rate and atrial contractility. The M3 receptor, like the M1, works via the GQ protein, and this has a variety of functions, including things like increasing exocrine gland secretions, increasing gut peristalsis, increasing, bla increasing bladder contraction, causing meiosis, and it does this by increasing pupillary muscle contraction, causing accommodation, and it does this via ciliary muscle contraction, stimulates insulin re release, and it leads to endothelium-mediated vasodilatation. And then we have the dopamine receptors. The dopamine D1 receptor works through the GS protein and when stimulated causes relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle and activates the direct pathway of the striatum, while the D2 receptor works through the GI protein and when that is stimulated will modulate transmitter release and inhibit direct pathway of striatum. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and pause. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer.
correct answer here is A, H1. So the last two types of receptors we have here are the histamine and the vasopressin receptors. So the histamine H1 receptor is GQ mediated, and when stimulated, it will increase vascular permeability, cause bronchoconstriction, increase nasal and bronchial mucus production, as well as cause pruritus and pain. The H2 receptor is GS mediated, and this increases gastric acid secretion. The vasopressin receptors are V1 and V2. Now the V1 receptor works through the GQ protein, and this increases vascular smooth muscle contraction, while the V2 receptor works through the GS protein, and when stimulated, will increase water permeability and reabsorption, and it does this by upregulating aquaporin-2 in the renal collecting tubules, as well as increases the release of von Willenbrand factor. Now, before we move on to the next section, here's just a quick reminder of the way acetylcholine and norepinephrine are made. And on the next slide, I've also included the medications that can inhibit and speed up their release. So make sure you know um, this information. I'm not gonna cover it because I just basically be describing a picture to you, but make sure you go through this. It's also in your first aid. It's in every book, essentially. Make sure you know this because these are high yield pieces of information. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B, bethanicol. So this falls into the category of colonal mimetics that are known as direct agonists. This also includes uh, carbacol, methacholine, and pilocarpine. So bethanicol is gonna be used in urinary retention, and it works by activating the smooth muscle in the bladder, and it's also resistant to acetylcholine esterase and has no nicotinic activity. Carbacol is resistant to ACHE as well, and it works to constrict the pupils, which is why it's so effective in relieving intraocular pressure that's associated with open angle glaucoma. Methacholine is used as a challenge for the diagnosis of asthma, and it's used for this because what it does is it stimulates the muscarinic receptors in the airway when it's inhaled, and we commonly see this type of question on the exam, so make sure you remember that. Now, pilocarpine is very good at stimulating the formation of sweat, tears, and saliva, which is why it's very effective as a treatment modality with Chagrin syndrome. It can also be used in cases of open angle glaucoma, where it provides relief by constricting the ciliary muscle of the eye, and also in closed angle glaucoma by contracting the pupillary sphincter. Now, as with the other drugs I mentioned, this is resistant to acetylcholine esterase, and it can cross the blood-brain barrier. All right, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and pause, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B, it is a tertiary amine. So to answer this one, you need to know, of course, that physostigmine is the drug used as the antidote for anticholinergic toxicity. It's also able to freely cross the blood-brain barrier, which makes it different from neostigmine, which does not penetrate the CNS. Let's take a look at the other medications that are in the same class of indirect agonists that act on acetylcholine esterases. So first we have donepezil. This increases ACH, and this is a first-line drug used for Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's not always used, but if medications are needed, this is generally what would be used. Okay, Edrophonium is also used in this class, and you may not know that this used to be the drug of choice to diagnose myasthenia gravis, depending on how long you've been studying. If you've been studying for several years, you might think that, but we don't use that anymore. Now, the way we diagnose myasthenia gravis is with the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody test, also known as the anti-ACHRAB. Next, we have neostigmine, which I mentioned earlier, doesn't penetrate the CNS. So this can be used after surgery to aid with neurogenic ileus, as well as with urinary retention. As well, it can be used to reverse neuromuscular junction blockade. And it's also effective in managing myasthenia gravis. The last one here is pyridostigmine. Pyridostigmine is a long-acting medication that is effective in improving the strength in those who have myasthenia gravis. Now, because it has some worrisome side effects, we can add either propanthaline, glycopyrrolate, or hyoscyamine to counter those effects. All right, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and pause the video. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is D, hyoscyamine. And we can add the drug diclosiamine to the list for IBS as well. Now, the rest of the muscarinic antagonists will include atropine, which, remember, produces madriasis and cycloplegia. 
uh, benzodiazepine, which is used in Parkinson's disease and is effective in managing acute dystonia. Glycopyrrolate, which we touched a little bit on earlier, is used uh, preoperatively to reduce airway secretions, and it can also be used orally to counteract drooling as well as peptic ulcers. We have ipratropium and tiotropium. We'll talk about these more so in respiratory, but these are used for COPD and asthma. We have oxybutynin, which is used to reduce bladder spasms and urge incontinence in anybody who has an overactive bladder. And then scopolamine, which is used in the management of motion sickness. Um, so make sure you remember those medications. They are highly tested. Let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and pause this one and figure it out and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B, dobutamine. So dobutamine is a direct sympathomimetic and it's used in heart failure, cardiogenic shock, as well as in cardiac stress testing. And if asked on your exam, don't forget that with this drug, inotropy is greater than chronotropy. Now let's look at the other drugs of this class. There's a few of them. There's albuterol, uh, dopamine, epinephrine, phenyldopam, isoproteranol, uh, mitodrine, mirabegron, norepinephrine, and phenylephrine. Albuterol, along with salmitrol and terbutaline, have stronger beta-2 than beta-1 action. Now, while they can increase heart rate, their effect is minimal. Now, we're gonna use albuterol, of course, for what? For acute asthma attacks. We can also use it for COPD. Salmitrol is going to be used to control asthma as well as COPD, but long-term. And then we have terbutaline. This is going to be used in asthmatics who are experiencing an acute bronchospasm. Now, dopamine has equal effects on the D1 and the D2 receptors, more so than on beta receptors, and then lastly on alpha. So D1, D2 equally greater than beta, greater than alpha. Now, in high doses, the uh, administration of dopamine can increase blood pressure, heart rate, heart rate, and cardiac output. And we can use this in patients who have unstable bradycardia, shock, as well as heart failure. Remember, at lower doses, as the result of beta stimulation, we will see chronotropic and inotropic effects, but at higher doses, we'll see vasoconstriction because at that point, we'll also start to see a stimulation of the alpha receptors. Very important to keep that in mind. Different doses, different effects. Epinephrine. Epinephrine is characterized by stronger beta stimulation than alpha stimulation, but at high doses, it affects blood pressure, and at normal doses, it increases heart rate and cardiac output. Now we can use epinephrine for what? For anaphylaxis, for asthma, as well as for open angle glaucoma. Phenyldopam is a D1 receptor agonist, and we, you can, we can use this post-op for hypertension as well as in hypertensive crisis patients. And this can cause vasodilation and it can promote uh, natriuresis. It can also lead to hypotension and tachycardia, so you wanna make sure you use this cautiously. Isoproteranol is going to affect the beta-1 and beta-2 receptors equally, and we can use this in cases of asthma, emphysema, and bronchitis, and it can also cause relaxation of the GI and uterine smooth muscle. Important to keep that in mind. Mitodrine is an alpha-1 receptor agonist. We use this in autonomic insufficiency as well as in cases of postural hypotension. Mirabegron is a beta-3 receptor agonist, and we use this in the management of urinary urgency, urinary incontinence, and overactive bladder. And we talked about the M3 receptor earlier as well with respect to uh, bladder function. Norepinephrine is going to affect first alpha-1, greater than alpha-2, greater than beta-1. And we're going to use this in the management of hypotension and septic shock. We can also uh, keep in mind that the administration of norepinephrine will have some uh, effects on our physiology. Namely, it increases blood pressure, it increases heart rate, and it increases cardiac output. And finally, phenylephrine is going to affect the alpha-1 receptor more so than the alpha-2 receptor, and we can use this to manage hypotension uh, as a medriasis-inducing agent in ocular procedures. As well, it can be used for ischemic priapism and commonly as a nasal decongestion, the spray. And something important I want to talk to you about uh, just real quick before we end this lecture is with the um, over-the-counter phenylephrine sprays, we get something known as a rebound effect, where if you use them too much, you actually get the opposite effect, where they don't cause um, constriction of the vessels in the nasal cavity. They actually cause dilation, which is why you can use them. You get momentarily um, clear sinuses, but then it'll actually get worse. That's the rebound effect associated with the alpha-1 receptor stimulating phenylephrine nasal decongestants. All right, so keep that in mind. It's very important, highly tested. All right, that is the end of lecture two. We will see you on the next lecture. <laughs>